Uh, I was a junior member in aesthetics when Lambert and Rebecca were uh, in the MPhil program there. Uh, as Ron mentioned, I'm also one of the editors and the graphic designer for the Festgrift. I'm going to start by recounting Lambert's path to where he finds himself today and then share with you three things. A comment in absentia from Calvin Sierville, one of Lambert's mentors at ICS. A testimonial from Nicholas Waltersdorf, also in absentia, in absentia, a longtime colleague and friend. And an excerpt from a forthcoming review of the Festgrift by Lambert's student, Trisha Van Dyke. I think I saw Trisha's name on there, so I guess he's not in absentia completely. Lambert began his graduate studies at ICS 50 years ago, in the fall of 1972. He completed his MPhil degree with a thesis on Kant's aesthetics in 1975, and then became the first student in ICS's joint doctoral program with the Freie Universität, the Free University in Amsterdam. During the first year of their marriage, Joyce and Lambert lived in West Berlin where he researched and drafted a dissertation on Adorno's aesthetics. He completed his PhD in June 1981 under the supervision of Calvin Sierwald and Johan Vanderhoof. The same summer, Joyce and Lambert moved to Edmonton, Alberta, where he taught at the King's College, now King's University, for four years. They moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan in 1985. Lambert taught at Calvin College for 17 years, chaired the philosophy department for six, and led the Urban Institute for Con Contemporary Arts through a major building project and capital campaign. In 2002, he took up the ICS position in systematic philosophy, originally created by Hendrik Hart, and received cost appointments in philosophy and theology at the University of Toronto and the Toronto School of Theology. He retired in 2016. Since then, Lambert has been a visiting scholar at Calvin University in Grand Rapids, where he and Joyce with, live with their dog, Ruby, and cat, Mi Misha. Did I get that name right, Lambert? Lambert remains an active scholar, having published four books since his retirement, with two more either in production or under review. During that time, McGill Queen's University Press has published two volumes of essays in reformational philosophy. First, Art, Education, and Cultural Renewal in 2017. And just a few months ago, Shattering Silos, Re-Imaging -re Knowledge, Politics, and Social Critique. The MIT Press published the book Truth in Husserl, Heidegger, and the Frankfurt School in 2017. And in 2021, Wippenstock published a new memoir titled To Sing Once More, Sorrow, Joy, and the Dog I Love. Several of these books are preliminary studies for a big book on truth that Routledge plans to publish in March 2023 titled Social Domains of Truth, Science, Politics, Art, and Religion, it marks a continuation, culmination in Lambert's life work. He is also waiting to learn when Adorno, Heidegger, and the Politics of Truth, his new book on critical theory, will be published. It is currently under review at Sunny Press. Lambert is an active member of Westminster Presbyterian Church in Grand Rapids where he sings in the adult choir. He also sings with two other vocal ensembles, Choral Connection and the Chamber Choir of Grand Rapids. Hiking, swimming, and camping with Ruby, their lovely golden retriever, keep him feeling younger than he is. Cal, Calvin Sierveld commented, it is a gift from God, I believe, to live to celebrate your student's accomplishment. Even though it be prudent for aging me to be bodily absent from this happy occasion, I am grateful to be present in spirit and with a brief comment. 
At times I have wondered how Plato would critically judge his student Aristotle's grounding human reasoning and sensation. And Gamaliel probably never appreciated his student, the Apostle Paul's impressive presentation to King Agrippa and Roman Governor Festus. But it is fascinating to probe the relative strengths and differences between mentors and students. At a certain point, each generation assumes its own complex sense and responsibility. I am glad I once pointed Lambert to Berlin and Adorno. His PhD dissertation with myself and Johann von der Hooven was unusual at the time for a North American and prepared Lambert to give genuine leadership in the following decades on the struggle between continental and Anglo-linguistic academic philosophical circles engulfed by social turmoil. I find seeking stillness or the sound of wings a breathtaking testimony to the rich diversity of Lambert's professional philosophical activity and artistic interests along with Joyce's artwork. Michael, Peter, Hector, and Matthew deserve warm thanks for its fine, complicated production. As Francis Bacon would say, this volume deserves to be chewed and digested. I pray, Lambert and Joyce, that you will have fruitful years of service still ahead, and that the Graduate Institute for Christian studies and friends be quietly blessed by your work. Nicholas Waldersdorf conveyed, I've been reading around in Lambert Zeiderwart's latest book, Shattering Silos, Reimagining Knowledge, Politics, and Social Critique. A good deal of the book consists of Lambert returning to fundamental issues that have long concerned him. And that has led me, in turn, to reflect on the inscape of Lambert's work as a whole. As many of you will know, I borrow the term inscape from the early 20th century poet Gerard Manley Hopkins. By the inscape of a thing, Hopkins meant its distinctiveness. A good deal of philosophical writing has nothing very distinctive about it. It's run-of-the-mill philosophy. Lambert's work as a whole has inscape. It's distinctive. There is nothing quite like it on the philosophical scene. Let me highlight three aspects of its inscape. Lambert is located firmly in the tradition of reformational philosophy. It has to be said that a good deal of writing in the tradition of reformational philosophy has been esoteric. One has to be embedded in the tradition to understand the terminology being used and to follow the line of argument. Lambert's writing is anything but esoteric. In his hands, the tradition becomes accessible. Second, Lambert doesn't just bury his nose in the reformational tradition. He creatively engages contemporary continental philosophers especially those of the Frankfurt School, learning from them, critiquing them. And third, Lambert has also read around in contemporary analytic philosophy and creatively engages philosophers in that tradition on a number of issues, especially on aesthetic issues and on the nature of truth. Nothing on the contemporary philosophical scene has quite this instinct. Oh, I forgot to mention the unfailing generosity of Lambert's engagement with other thinkers. In a forthcoming review of Seeking Stillness, to be published later this year in Philosophie Reformata, Tricia Van Dyck writes, Seeking Stillness seeks to honor Lambert as both teacher and scholar. The book rings with affection and respect. Introducing him as a well-loved and much admired scholar whose life and work demonstrate his commitment to principles of justice, solidarity, and resourcefulness. 
Beyond his principles, the tenderness and generosity he demonstrates in daily life shine through in the accolades of his students and colleagues. Balancing the respect expressed by contributors for his scholarly abilities and commitments. The book does an impressive job of simultaneously honoring Zeitervart, promoting his work, and seeking to carry the conversation further. With few exceptions, the essays in Seeking Stillness directly engage with Zeitervart's work, sometimes in significant depth. The inclusion of artworks in the collection is not merely symbolic, but contributes significantly to the success of the volume. Next, Ronald Kuypers will present a bound copy of the Festgrift to Lambert, after which, uh, without interruption, Festgrift co-editor Michael DeMoor will lead a panel discussion, which he will introduce. Thanks, Peter. Um, before I get started on, on the presentation, uh, I was a little remiss. I had intended to begin our uh, festivities today with a word of prayer and asking for God's blessing on our event today, and I'd still like to do that, so if you please bow your heads with me. Uh, dear Maker and Redeemer, thank you that we could gather here as friends and colleagues and students of Lambert's Eidervart, that we could celebrate his work would you bless our discussion today? Uh, may it be enriching and uh, be a source of wisdom for everybody. This we pray in the name of our uh, Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, I just want to, uh, before I present the book, say just a few personal words. Uh, Joyce and Lambert, when they lived in Toronto, were neighbors of mine. And uh, I don't know if you know, but Joyce is the handy one in the family. So I really miss bumping into you at Home Depot, Joyce. And every time I'm there, I'm thinking, Maybe Joyce is here, but no, she's not. She's in back in Grand Rapids, which is really all. Uh, but Joyce's uh, artwork is on the cover of the book. And if I get out of the way, you can see it here. It's wonderful artwork. And, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know, Lambert, you can speak to that a bit when you're up here. But um, Lambert, too, has been a very important scholar to me. Um, we heard the words of Nick Walterstorff talk about Lambert as a generous scholar, and that was actually the word I was going to use. I remember when I was a doctoral student at ICS, uh, under uh, the supervision of uh, the late Hendrik Hart, I was doing a chapter on uh, the philosopher Jürgen Habermas, and Hank had a pretty allergic reaction to this philosopher, and I couldn't really say what I wanted to say, so I, uh, I reached out in an email to Lambert in desperation. We didn't know each other very well back then, but he was, uh, he's like, yeah, send it to me, I'll uh, read it, and he made all kinds of great critical comments, and he didn't have to do that, and I think if you talk to anybody in this room and other people who contributed this book, We'll have similar stories to tell about Lam the, the generous time Lambert would give to students to help them through their philosophical quandaries. And uh, so I count him as one of my best friends. And so tonight is a very, uh, today is a very special afternoon. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. But Lambert, without further ado, I welcome you to come up here and receive your bound copy of Seeking Stillness or the Sound of Wings. Thank you. I'm just going to say uh, thank you to Ron and to Peter, who's already introduced this event. Thank you to all who are gathered here, both in person and online. Uh, I'm looking forward to saying more words of thanks later, but I'm very, very happy to be here. I'm Michael DeMoor. I um, am uh, one of the co-editors of the book. Um, and. Um, I was very kindly invited um, to come to Toronto from the far off um, inscapes of uh, the western part of, the, uh, of, of this country uh, to facilitate a conversation uh, about um, Lambert's work, about some of the essays in this book, and uh, about the themes that emerge from that. So we invited, uh, we've got um, four uh, panelists here with me. I'll just quickly introduce them. Um, but they can say a little bit more about themselves. The way we're going to run this is I'm going to give each of them uh, a chance to say a few words. They're not going to go on at a uh, terribly great length, but to say a few words to introduce some ideas and themes, um, some uh, of their primary takeaways and questions. Then we're going to talk back and forth for a little while. 
and then we're going to give Lambert a chance to respond uh, to all the calumnies and misunderstandings that we <laughs> set. Um, and uh, and uh, then uh, uh, and then there will also be a chance for um, the uh, for those of you in the room and also those of you online to contribute questions or comments and so on as well. I'm going to try to keep track of time. Obviously, we started late. We'll try not to end too much uh, too late either. But that's the plan for unfolding. So we have with us uh, Alison Carr, um, who is a, a former student of Lambert. Most of not everyone was online here. We have Shannon Hoff, who is a former colleague, um, a, senior, a, a senior member at um, at ICS. Uh, Joe Kirby, um, Dean Detloff, both of them uh, former students of Lambert's. Uh, I also was a former doctor student of Lambert's. Although I keep saying former, right? Does one stop being a student of, uh, of one's magister? I don't know. Um, maybe once one actually starts coming up with ideas of one's own, which I hope <laughs> happens um, at some time in my life. Uh, so without further ado, uh, we're going to go uh, Allison, then Shannon, then Joe, then Dean. They're each going to take five minutes, present some ideas, and then we're going to have a we're going to have a conversation, and hopefully it'll be really enlightening. Uh, so Allison, why don't you start us off? Michael. So we're starting, we're starting with me because um, the topic that I'm raising is, uh, is art and aesthetics in, uh, in, in the work that we have before us, in Lambert's work. And, um, and, and that was sort of the beginning of the conversation, if you will, um, for, uh, for Lambert. Um, but as, as we're starting conversations, um, I, I also just want, to, um, I just want to take a moment to uh, acknowledge uh, the land and the territory that we're on um, as, as part of opening that conversation. And so this is the traditional territory of the um, Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, uh, the Wendat, and the, um, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And um, I always find that it's really important to, to honor that as I, as I start, um, as, I, as I learn my own history and my own story and, um, and of, of movement, of, of, of translation, and, and, and of, uh, of where I find myself in a tradition. So, uh, so with that, uh, with that opening, I, I, I'll say I'll start by saying that I met um, I met Lambert uh, in 1999, um, taking an aesthetics course, and um, that aesthetics course I had just decided to to go into philosophy. Um, I had started out saying I'm going to become a you know a, a high school teacher and uh, and and specifically uh, teach uh, children behavioral problems. So this was a bit of a, a bit of a left turn uh, when I went into this, and uh, it turns out that the aesthetics course was the only course at the time that fit with my already very full academic schedule, and I was mad. I was very angry. Um, I did not want to take this aesthetics course. You might not have known that, Lambert, but <laughs> I thought aesthetics. Oh, really? That's that's just so off to the side. You know, who wants who wants to talk about? Sorry, Joyce. Who wants to talk about art? Who wants to talk about beauty? I don't. I don't want to talk about these things. These things have been hammers, um, you know, that have that have been used violently, and uh, in in my life and in many others' lives. Um, and so I walked into that class uh, feeling very irritable and and suspicious. Uh, I will say. And by the time that the course ended, um, it had. I, I, I really say this with all truth, that had changed the course of my life. Um, so Lambert's claim in that course, and the reason that I'm bringing it up here is, um, I, I, I remember him saying uh, that from, from aesthetics, that, that aesthetics and, and, uh, and art are, the, are, are not just a marginal thing in philosophy. Um, they are the, the, beating, the beating core, the beating heart of philosophy. And I think you use slightly different words than that, but, um, uh, but 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 that was that was clearly the intent, um, and and I remember hearing that and thinking that can't be so. That's that's not true. But um, but you know I dug into it and I said okay well well what does he mean by that? And I, and I, I as I as I worked through the course materials as I listened to the lectures, um, it it all started to come together and and, um, and and you can see this throughout throughout this book. It's it's just on it, in many ways it's on almost every page, and uh, 
as I was as I was looking through through this book, and and I thought, well, where do I start? Um, you know, to to introduce this notion of of art and aesthetics as um, at, as that starting point that um, that Lambert entered into, and and that really gets into all of the things that that make um, that make, make philosophy so. I, Life-giving when it is, and um, and that that really open up human experience uh, in in ways that uh, that other things might not have as easy a time doing. Not to say that they can't, um, but to say that entering through aesthetics and through art um, is is a, a, an entry point that uh, that opens things up. I would say in an easier in an easier way than than other things. As I looked at the as I looked at the essays, um, Walter Storff stuck out for me. There were a few others that stuck out for me. Um, I loved the words that um, that Peter you, you read from from Walter Storff. Those were those were really beautiful. Um, and and I thought, oh gosh, the the more I dig into these essays, if if I start talking about any of them, we're, we're headed straight in into systemic racism and white supremacy. Uh, with Walter Storff's article uh, talking about the the statue of Lee. Um, that has thankfully come down, um, and 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 all of that conversation. Uh, if we get into my article, you know, <laughs> we go straight into sexual assault, and um, and and trauma. And if if we get like some of the one of the paintings is 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 looking at the experience of schizophrenia, um, it it really does. Just no matter almost where you go, uh, it, it goes into deep deep experiences of of the human condition. And how we how we relate with each other, how we relate to uh, creation, to our environment, um, to the world at large. And so that's what I really wanted to lift up. Five minutes is not enough time to, and that's that's all that Michael said we had. <laughs> uh, five minutes is not really enough time to dig into any of of that. Um, but 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 this is the aspect of the book that I would like to lift up and and start with uh, to say that uh, you know I'll just I'll just read a, a quote. Um, from from the book um, that I think will lead us into some of the other uh, some of the other panelists um, and and just really invite people to think about uh, to think about that as as we have our discussion today. Uh, this is from the introduction, actually. It says so Zeidebart's work in philosophical aesthetics led him to develop the basics of an original account of truth in order to understand artistic truth and a critical social theory in order to contextualize and distinguish the social role of art throughout, he works by engaging in a process of critical retrieval of a wide variety of authors. And I think that is really at the heart of this book. And uh, there's so much fruit that comes from that entry point, um, and, uh, and, and there's so much more I could say about that, but um, I'm just gonna lift that up for now. So thank you. Thanks, Allison. Shannon. And we get to also test, make sure the mics work both in both directions. Can you hear me? Is this a good volume? Very good. <laughs> um, it's strange not to see the physical audience, but I trust you're there <laughs> and can hear me. Um, it's a bittersweet experience to, to be here remotely because I realize how much I'd like to be there in person. Um, and I'm sad to, to just be stuck here in Newfoundland. <laughs> uh, it's gray and foggy and rainy over here, in case you uh, were wondering. I mean, that's usually. <laughs> um, I was also Lambert's student uh, before being his colleague. I was his student at Calvin College. And so I've known Lambert for, um, wow, almost 30 years. So that's pretty, pretty special because I, I you know, I feel like I was 30 just yesterday. <laughs> not... And he's been quite a, a presence, a, a loyal and gentle and strong um, presence in my life um, at every turn. Um, most recently, the, the memories I have of Lambert are the way he could command a meeting. When I was his colleague at ICS, I was really, I learned a lot about how to run a meeting. And Lambert, you might, be interested in knowing that I'm taking that skill um, on here in Newfoundland. I just became associate dean for the year for a, as an acting position. So, so your influence continues to persist um, over here at Memorial University. 
Um, I wanted to talk in particular today about um, one one philosophical issue, the, the one that has commanded much of your attention for the last little while, the issue of truth. And, uh, you know, in the position of associate dean, I'm rather rather swamped at the moment. So I focused mostly on what I know that you have already talked about with regard to truth and not so much on the volume that we have in front of us, though many of the essays in that volume do talk about your 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 taking on this, this really difficult and huge topic. So when I was a senior member at ICS, I had the, the privilege of co-teaching um, with other senior members, a two-part course that, that Lambert had designed on the topic of truth. Um, and I remember thinking, I can't do this. <laughs> I am completely disoriented by this topic. It feels so much like we travel inside of truth. And to, to get a perspective on that topic seems impossible. Um, and so, first of all, I want to recognize that, that it's quite an accomplishment for you to have taken on the project of discerning uh, the character of this thing that we travel inside, the thing that we feel claimed by. Um, and so it's, it's impressive to me that, that you've taken it on as a topic. And I'm sure, I'm sure philosophy will be indebted to you for doing this systematic work, this thorough work, this comprehensive work. And I, I, I really can't believe how prolific <laughs> you are, um, especially with regard to this topic. So in particular, I, I wanted, you know, I, am, I have become more and more a phenomenologist uh, to the core uh, beginning with Hegel and then Merleau-Ponty and Heidegger and so on. And so the the things that Heidegger says about truth really strike me. Um, and basically the thing I'm going to talk about today is just this, your your engagement with Heidegger, with Heidegger and um, some questions from, that arise for me out of that engagement. Um, so Heidegger dedicates himself to to exploring the rich dimensions of of being within truth about uh, of of first of all being within experience as a as a phenomenologist you know thinking about the fact that we are already inside of experience this it's already unfolding once we start doing philosophy and it is this experience that we have to be answerable to in in articulating ourselves philosophically or articulating philosophical truth um but similarly truth is our so, so Heidegger asks, what is the experience of truth? How do we experience truth? What is truth inside of experience? And in a sense, you know, well, uh, never mind. I, I won't go down there with that as a tra trajectory. That will just take me as far afield. So how does experience shed light on the nature of truth, it seems to me, is Heidegger's question. And the experience of truth, it seems to Heidegger, is something like this, as Lambert explains so well. It's always a here and now um an an experience of insight or revelation of a specific thing um in which other modes of the experience of truth other truths uh are concealed so that the one that we are involved in can come to the fore the one who comes to light at the cost of the darkness of the rest of the theater uh the receding into darkness of other events of revelation it is the revelation of a singular it's a singular experience, an experience of some one thing. The experience of truth is like this. We have the sense of being beholden to it, answerable to it, not in charge of it, not, not creative of it. It is something that we speak in responsiveness to. Um, and it's not just about assertion, but about answerability. Through the experience of truth, and this links it with art, um, our sense is that we're not just matching reality. When we experience something truthful, our sense is that reality becomes bigger and our past experience is re-illuminated in light of that bigger, the, the, the increase in our sense of what things are. Um, and yet, of course, in an experience of truth, uh, again, what was, what had come to light previously recedes into the darkness. Um, not that it's not true, it's just that the experience of truth occludes in its very nature. Um, further, it seems to me, truth is a matter of a claim upon us 
it makes a claim upon us and it and it asks of us do we allow things to be revealed are we the site for revelation or do we conceal them in idle talk for instance or by acting inauthentically in heidegger's terms and finally as lambert so nicely shows in his book on truth and heidegger and critical theory um truth is a matter of relation within being inside of the experience of truth and falsity we witness to the standing forth of beings. We witness to them in their self-giving. Um, so the issue in Heidegger seems to be, and this is why I think, as Lambert thinks as well, that it's so uh, fundamental for, or so, in a sense, orienting for analytic philosophies of truth, which are not so concerned with the, with the experience of truth and with the the fact that we travel within it. Um, more formal and abstract conceptions of truth happen inside of that experience and on its basis, and they have to be answerable to it, answerable to this fundamental experience of it as an anchor. Um, and assertions and the idea that assertion, that truth has to do with assertions are, are often made without a sense of this ground from which they are derivative um, and take too much authority upon themselves. So, of course, this is all in a sense to repeat Lambert's um, discussion of Heidegger. I just wanted to take a few minutes to, to give that my own account so that we have something to talk about if we, if we want to talk about this issue of truth in Lambert and Heidegger. Um, so I have a few questions. Um, I wonder, unlike, uh, it, it seems that um, Heidegger and Lambert could, might be close in, their, in La Lambert's argument regarding flourishing. Um, Heidegger exposes the relationality bet between Dasein and being, showing that that is what is at stake in the in in the nature of truth. Um, and and in his technology essay and in the letter on humanism, he he talks of Dasein's being claimed and not not claiming, but being claimed by something that Dasein might not be answer might not be capable of answering to. So I, I think there are there are resources in Heidegger to talk about this flourishing, even though he may not necessarily put it that way. So this is one of the questions I guess I have uh, to Lambert. Um, further, uh, in one of the essays on truth, um, or maybe it's that I can't remember now exactly where it is, Lambert, you say that comprehensive truth seems to call for public authentication. Uh, if it cannot be publicly publicly authenticated, then one wonders how it can even be truth. And I wonder if 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 a kind of um pushback could come from Heidegger here. You know, if if pub the public is inauthentic, if the public is engaged in idle talk, if the public is being fleeced by by you know politicians and capitalist mega organizations and so on, is is democratic public authentication possible or desirable? And is truth something that is importantly distinct from what is publicly authentic authenticatable? And finally, with regard to the the reformational conception of truth that you that you aim to develop in um, another text, um, I wonder if one of the arguments one could use there in relation particularly to the to the difference between you and Doiverd is the is the the exposition of this character of being within it is only by being within a finite experience having a finite perspective within this world that we become alive to issues of truth in the first place it's only by being cultivated by others who are specific to us and whose specificity we cannot see clearly uh, that we are cultivated to be in the posture of care that would allow us to be sites of disclosure for truth. So using the phenomenological idea of the specificity of experience and the, and the finitude of our perspective as the very condition under which we become capable of being sites of uh, disclosure, I think is where it is just perhaps one of the resources that one could use to develop a different reformational conception of truth um, because it's not because it's this very character of being within uh, that is both the condition th through which we are prevented from arriving at universality or a universal conception of truth or an absolute conception of truth and it is the thing that 
allows us to be alive to the importance, the mattering of truth. Um, because through it, we care for the specific, we learn to care for the specific right in front of us. Uh, so it's a bit disconcerting to, to say these things to a computer screen, and I hope I've made myself relevant <laughs> in the absence of actual connection with actual people. Um, but I hope, I hope, yeah, this event unfolds well and that my comments can provide some fodder for discussion and thought. Thank Thanks you. so much, Shannon. Um, Shannon had to change a flight uh, last night just so that she could uh, have the time to be, uh, uh, to be with us for the whole time. Otherwise, she would have had to just dash these off right at the very beginning and then dash off herself. So we're really grateful that you can hang around, uh, Shannon, even if it's electronically. Uh, Joe. Hmm. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Lambert's indexer. I've been doing this for eight or nine years. I feel very blessed. I, I really enjoy making his indexes, and uh, we're now waiting for the page. The page is uh, the proofs for the magnum opus on truth, which is should have already come, but now it's apparently coming sometime in January. So. <laughs> Um, so when I made the index for this particular book, I remember being quite taken aback by uh, Cal Cerebell's essay, uh, mostly because it didn't really fit the, the mold you'd expect in a festschrift, which is to say the essay was quite critical, in fact, um, which is, I mean, at some level, very res a very respectful thing to do as a philosopher. We're, we're orienting ourselves towards truth. All right, let's, let's play ball here. We're not going to, he even says at the beginning, I'm not going to eulogize Lambert here. I'm going to, I'm going to like, <laughs> I'm going to criticize him. Let's, we're going. Um, and, I mean, indeed, at the end of the essay, he says, um, uh, I think Lambert's understanding of truth is wrong, and I strongly encourage him to rethink it. Which, again, given that there's a 500-page book on truth about to come out, <laughs> is a very sort of surprising and intriguing thing to say. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so the thing that uh, Cervell takes issue with in Lambert's understanding of truth is the idea that truth is a historical process that unfolds in time. Against this, I, I see that Servelt is taking a more classical understanding that truth is, is an unchanging structure. And, and indeed, not only is truth an unchanging structure, but the philosophies of Vollenhoven and Doyeweird are pretty good reflections of this unchanging structure. Uh, so Lambert also orients himself in light of these thinkers. It's sort of uh, in the background, but it's there. But he basically throws out all of the stuff where Vollenhoven and Doyeweird try to uh, uh, adopt some kind of trans-historical knowledge claim, which for Cerveld is sort of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Our job as people who have inherited this tradition, it, it, from Cerveld's perspective, it seems to me, is that we want to take that sort of gold that they uncovered and, and translate it as best we can to the next generation. Not do, not do this sort of critical retrieval where we change it in some fundamental way. So this is one topic we might discuss later, this question of tradition, uh, what has to stay the same and what has to change? How do we honor the, the voices that we have inherited from the past? Um, so that's something just on hold for the moment. Uh, for several, the stakes of this debate are absolutely enormous. Uh, we're basically talking about the relationship between humanity and God and not, not to go too far down this road, but he's basically saying Lambert is going the wrong way in this relationship. Doibert and Volanovan had it, and, and Lambert is sort of taking it away from that. Sort of, and this is in uh, the Moore's essay as well. He kind of goes this play, he like this, this mixing the reformational tradition with these other traditions dilutes it and makes it less uh, uh, true. Yeah, some <laughs> so, why does Cerveld think it's such a disaster that Lambert takes this historical vision of truth? Uh, as I was preparing for this very short presentation, I did a little bit of peripheral reading, and I came across a very interesting passage in a, uh, from a lecture by a fellow named Leo Strauss back in 1941 on German nihilism. And he says, as, as, as I quote, I do not see how those can resist the voice of that siren, i.e. nihilism, who expect the answer to the first and last question from history who are guided not by a standard which is stable and not changeable, which is known and not merely believed. In other words, the lack of resistance to nihilism seems to be due ultimately to the depre depreciation and contempt of reason, which is one and unchangeable, or it is not. Ah. So again, I think Cerebeld is hearkening towards this classical vision of truth as a perduring standard that does not change, and his critique of Lambert's position is that, is also following the contours of this, of this move by Leo Strauss, 
If you do not believe in such an unchanging standard, or that even if we don't know it, that it exists, you will ultimately not be able to resist evil. Uh, and to be clear, I don't think that Serveld thinks that Lambert is a nihilist, but I think he would say that this historicization of truth is a step in the direction of nihilism, and that once you take this step, you will ultimately not be able to resist going all the way down to Nietzsche. Just to... <laughs> okay, three more points, th three more points. First, the line that reason is one and unchangeable or it is not echoes perfectly with an essay that follows Serveld's in this volume by a younger scholar by the name of Joshua Harris. And Harris argues that Lambert's understanding of truth is both, quote, ancient and original, perennial and unprecedented. Why? Because Lambert thinks that truth is not one, not unchangeable, but that it still exists, and that it is also important and makes claims on us. So in the millennia-long history of Western philosophy, Lambert's position is very weird, and we all look forward to the reading his magnum opus <laughs> in a few months. <laughs> second point, second point. Uh, I don't think that Lambert is actually a historicist in this sense. Why? Uh, because he still appeals to, quote, God's transhistorical call to love. A true historicist, in my mind, would also be obliged to drop this, and to just say that, you know, the transhistorical call to love is a cultural construct of this, that, or the other culture at this time in this place. And if you make this move, then you are indeed going down the route that Serveld fears with an inability to resist evil and word or deed. You kind of melt a little bit. But again, Lambert doesn't do that because there's this transhistorical call to love that's kind of floating above the, this understanding of truth as a historical uh, sort of as subject to history. So in that sense, from my perspective, I see uh, the debate between Serveld and Lambert as moreover the content of what's in that transhistorical call to love, with Serveld having a very robust and content-filled vision of this call, whereas Lambert having a much more protean, if, if one might even say no content, but rather a kind of magnetic force that just sort of pulls us up that we respond to. And final point, if you're willing to play ball with me on this, this point about them, him not being a true historicist in, in the sense that, say, Leo Strauss would be worried about, then we're actually dealing here with two different kinds of religion, uh, a kind of two different types of religious position, one which is kind of hard, Cerebell's position, and another one that's kind of soft, which is Lambert's position. And from, in my opinion, from my perspective, I think that the actual way that the transhistorical call of love gets that, uh, op like, that we're able to hear it or open our hearts to it or our ears to it is via this kind of oscillation between a harder position and a softer position. And that's how, like Lambert's position, if you take it too far, will, will kind of melt you, whereas Cerebell's position, if you take it too far, will, will make you a bit stiff and hard and unable to kind of bridge the gaps between yourself and others. I'm getting this from Origen, uh, who, who takes it from the Three Books of Solomon. He says, you need Proverbs and you need Ecclesiastes. And if you got those two things together, then you get the Song of Songs. Oh. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and final point, this is going to segue into Dean here. Um, the, I mean, we're in a really dark position right now, at least in, if you look at the world as a whole. And it, there's a part of me that thinks, I, I, I tend in the direction of Lambert. I'm a more soft kind of religious position. But there's a part of me that thinks maybe we might nowadays need a, something a little bit harder to take us, to inspire us to actually kind of fight against this monstrous thing that's wrecking our planet. I mean, it's, yeah, so that is my move, because that's what Dean is going to talk about. <laughs> All right, and with no further ado, Dean, please. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I've been a little rusty in philosophy. I haven't been reading a lot of philosophy lately, but I really appreciated a chance to dig into the, this volume and, and read some, uh, some colleagues and friends and, and scholars. I'm really glad to share some space with uh, so many folks. Uh, these days I work in public justice for an organization called Development and Peace, and we do global solidarity work. And as I was rethinking Lambert's work, having been uh, part of his last crop of students, I took his very last classes at ICS and have maintained a, a dialogue with him since, uh, it has changed the way that I relate to Lambert's work, and I've just been thinking and reflecting more on that in the last couple of weeks. What is it like to revisit the work of this uh, very formative thinker in light of the day-to-day -day task of running around Ontario and organizing a handful of Catholics who are interested in social justice. So I want to talk a little bit about that in reference to a couple of these essays, too. 
Uh, oh, and I, I wanted to say too, just to echo that note about generosity from Lambert, I wanted to say one other thing I've appreciated about Lambert as a, a student and a younger scholar is uh, Lambert's capacity to uh, affirm and to name and affirm the kind of qualities of the people that he comes in contact with. And I think it's given me a lot of confidence to uh, not only be invited to comment on Lambert's work, but to find my, my own voice in my own way. And so I, I hope that this reflects a little bit of that as well. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about the way that both uh, Mike DeMora here and Jonathan Chaplin talk about Lambert's work. Um, the reason I chose Jonathan is that he's not here to defend himself, so I feel more confident. He has talked to you online. I, OK, well, uh, oh, dear. And I can see him, too. OK. Well, uh, good luck. OK, so um, <laughs> I read both of these essays, and uh, I was just trying to track you know, where, where do I see Lambert in, in, the, in these two essays, and, and what's my reaction. And what I found so fascinating is when I read Mike's essay, I felt uh, defensive of Lambert. I said, you know, the, the way that Mike sort of engages, as Joe was alluding to just now, is, is to sort of suggest in a, in a very hospitable way uh, and charitable way that nevertheless, maybe Lambert is a little too uh, loosey-goosey with all these non-reformational thinkers, maybe a little too Marxist, a little too, uh, a little too Adorno, a little too Habermas in the end. And, uh, and I would agree um, with the last part, uh, although for a different reason that I'll say at the end. Uh, and uh, and I thought, well, you know, if that's the case, then maybe that's so much the worse for reformational philosophy. What's so bad about that? Uh, I happen to be a you know a Catholic Marxist, and I studied at a Calvinist school. Is there's it's it's good to get all that stuff in a big pot and kind of see what happens, you know. So I didn't have that same that same anxiety, and so I found myself really defending uh, what I think is Lambert's courage to not only borrow from these other traditions, Marxism, critical theory, and so on, but to allow himself to be troubled by them and to really uh, to take them seriously for what they're, they're worth, uh, to the point of uh, you know, maybe changing some really fundamental pieces of, of the tradition that he inherits. Uh, on the other hand, when I read uh, Jonathan's essay, I found myself doing a bit of the opposite. I said, well, where's this revolutionary Lambert I was just so excited about? Now, you know, now we're in this Habermasian kind of problem, again, from the other direction, where I thought, well, I'm trying to get all these folks you know, hyped up about political justice, public justice. And Lambert has a lot of things to say about public justice that I think are very valuable. But uh, I once heard Ron responding to Lambert in a, a context like this, where he described Lambert's work as kind of like a, like a shiny sphere, and it's, it can be difficult to find like a handhold, like something to grab onto from which you can criticize it, because Lambert has both the, the gift and the, the kind of frustration sometimes of having, having his categories so neat and tidy that uh, everything kind of in the ecology of Lambert's thought makes every bit of sense. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's uh, all this Habermasian kind of systematizing uh, it can uh, kind of pull you out of, it can abstract you out of the, the weeds of you know, really needing to, to get something going. Um, so I found myself caught between these two reactions. You know, when I was reading Mike, I thought, oh, Lambert, oh, he's my guy, the Marxist guy I got to study with at ICS. And then uh, when I was reading Jonathan, I thought, ah, but he's also the Habermasian guy I, I got to study with. <laughs> and so uh, you know, Lambert and I have continued to, to dialogue about these things too. Um, in a number of contexts, interviews, and so on. And I've always appreciated that Lambert's very open to thinking through the practicality of that work, the real political context of that work. And as Joe was mentioning, you know, we live in a really challenging time. I was just on the subway reading the UN just put out some big thing about how we're doomed, you know, climate change is here, there's no going back. Uh, I'm sure everybody saw the IPCC report that's been coming out in parts in the last couple of years. And I think about that a lot. Uh, Lambert, I think, provides a language to think through those kinds of challenges and problems. But I think the kind of solution of a differential transformation that involves all of civil society that kind of pulls us out of not only the reformational tradition, but also the Marxist or other left traditions, uh, it may not have the kind of urgency and expediency that we need. And that's what I sort of wonder, or what I would like, like more of, uh, for instance, the IPCC report from the UN in their policy document, you know, all these scientists, they write a big policy document, we're climate scientists, and here is what we all ought to do to stop climate change. So the scientists wrote a policy document, then it has to get edited by 
by world governments. And uh, they, are, they leaked what the, the sort of discrepancies are between these two reports. What do the scientists say, and then how they get edited? And the edits are just so bonkers. You know, like, it will drive you to cynicism if you don't have something else going on in your life. Like, there's all these kinds of wild things. For instance, like, uh, like Brazil, one of the recommendations from scientists was, like, we should all eat less meat, right? Simple solution. Uh, and Brazil was like, we cannot do that. It is so important that we sell meat, Brazil specifically, right? And it's true, it's a huge part of their economy because of the history of colonialism and dependency and so on and so forth. And uh, so what we ended up with is a recommendation that doesn't have that recommendation anymore. We, it, there's nothing about eating less meat in that IPCC policy sort of document, right? So all that to say, I'm running around trying to organize all these Catholics and you know stop climate change with everybody else. and. Uh, I'm not actually sure that we can do it. I feel pretty pessimistic about it. I feel really optimistic about the folks I work with and, and everybody in this room and so on and, and all that. But, uh, you know, the benefit of reading Marx is Marx tells you, look, there's labor has a relation to capital. It works like this. If you don't go to work, they don't make profit and everything shuts down, right? You, that's the, the locus of power and that's why the working class is, is unique in, in that phase. What I like about Lambert's work is he tries to say, well, sure, but as Lambert once said to me, you know, revolution isn't what it used to be. I think that's true. Uh, but at the same time, you know, when push comes to shove, and, and it is coming to shove, like in the global south, it's coming to shove. A third of Pakistan's underwater, like right now, right? Like, then what are we supposed to do, right? Civil society is also not what it used to be. And I think I'm, I'm here at a bit of a loss, and I look forward to, to talking with everybody else. Uh, maybe you can help me sort of you know, solve this equation. Uh, where, what is it in Lambert's work that can help us uh, effect this differential kind of transformation in a moment of, of real urgent crisis? Thanks so much. Thanks, all of you. Um, I'm going to start by throwing a question back to you folks. You take them up as, as you see fit. And, but I don't necessarily feel like I have to direct things. If you guys just want to respond to each other and so on, Lambert's going to have a chance to respond to any and all of what he hears. Uh, but I wanted to start with a question that I, I love. One of my favorite things is to hear resonances from one folks to another. So starting with Allison and then Shannon um, in particular, you both talked the language when talking about art and then truth, right, about opening up um, and things coming to light, right? Uh, so Allison, you talked about that in the context of art as a crucial way of opening up experience. And um, uh, Shannon, um, as sort of part of the sort of Heideggerian disclosure of truth. And it struck me that when we tend to think about art, at least in our culture, and the way Heidegger clearly thinks about truth, when we're talking about opening up experience, we, we think of that when it does that authentically, it's individual experience, right? And when we learn to look at art, it's like, well, that's a really authentic uncovering uh, of this artist's experience, right? We trace it to an individual and their, and their experience to a large extent. Um, but Lambert, account of truth, is trying to pull things towards shared practices. Um, I wonder if, uh, right, to, that the horizon of truth is um, this sort of shared practices of, oh boy, I wrote it down uh, somewhere, of disclosure through fidelity, uh, uh, infidelity to societal principles, which isn't just something individuals do. Um, I, I don't know, Allison, I don't want to be, you know, I mean, there's always a danger of asking people to put on the spot. Is there a way in which art can do, can authentically uncover communal experience um, in a way that can be potentially transformational? And then, you know, and, and then Shannon, I, I'd, I'd love to hear like, how do you do this with phenomenology? Because again, phenomenology seems to be really good at getting at individual experience at that level of subjectivity, right? Rather than say in, intersubjectivity or something. Does that? Is that a fair question to ask you? Happy to take a stab at that, Michael. Um, Please. Indeed, I, I feel I feel like uh, I feel like my essay answers that question. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll just give a quick 
I'll just give a quick go. And, uh, and, and I think what, I'm, what I'll try to answer actually gets at your question that you ended with, Dean. Um, and uh, so, so in fact, that's where I'll start and then I'll answer your question and answering that. The thing that, that I find personally in, in Lambert's work that, um, that will help answer the sorts of, or that could help answer the sorts of questions that you're asking, Dean, because these are my questions too. I mean, we're literally colleagues. Uh, and you know my, my work right now um, is is in social justice and it's dealing with things like genocide and uh, and climate justice and the world ending and war. This is my this is my life. And so when I think about truth, honest honest to God, one of the things that that I think about in in trying to look at how do I find truth, how do I translate this this transition, the church's transition, trans tradition, um, when I'm talking about the church running residential schools, for example, and, and the genocide that occurred there, um, and, and, uh, and, and, and talk about the, the gospel at the same time. How do I hold this together? How is that possible? And uh, what kind of truth are we talking about um, which, when we're talking about, uh, when, when we're talking about Christianity. Oh, what kind of truth are we talking about when, when we're talking about finding the, uh, you know, finding the way uh, to deal with the climate crisis? And and I just keep coming back to that notion of truth as life giving disclosure. And um, and I, I think that there are um, there are subtle nuances in the way that I would uh, in the way that I would speak it from how Lambert would speak it. Um, and I've explored some of those in, in some of my own work, but. Um, but I think that it, it gets it, it it gets at the heart of of what truth is because when I um, you know when when I'm when I'm trying to, to talk about what uh, you know what love is and and all of these trans historical notions that I, I love that image of, of the magnet that you were talking about that sort of calls us uh, you know pulls us in that in that direction um, you know how do you unpack what love is. How, how do you how do you do that? Well, um, you know, you 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 have to look at uh, you, you have to look at what um, at, at at what I would call life giving disclosure and and what I you know what Lambert calls um, you know the, the the fidelity to you know holding and held and I I'm trying to come up with a phrase but I I'm, I'm not pulling it out of my memory right now but but. Um, you know, fidelity to those societal principles like justice, like solidarity, um, like I think resourcefulness actually was one of the ones that you identified as well, and that gets back to your question, um, Dean. And and how do you unpack all of that? Well, you asked the question, Michael. You know, uh, is there a way that art can do this? Is there a way that art can uh, you know open up that experience, find truth, and by truth I mean life-giving disclosure. I mean truth that is bounded in those uh, societal principles that are held and holding and, uh, you know, and linked to truth and solidarity and, uh, or sorry, justice and solidarity and all of these things. Um, the example that I give in, in my essay is that, uh, is, is the, the public dance that are, that are done um, in the uh, uh, One Billion Rising. Uh, that, uh, that are uh, choreographed to the song Breaking the Chain or Break the Chain. And that, uh, those, those public flash mobs, for lack of a better word, uh, where people come together, of course they practice ahead of time, and they perform this dance that has been previously choreographed. Um, you know, there's, it's the same song every time, Break the Chain. It's got more or less the same lyrics. It can be adapted. Um, but the choreography can change. The people, you know, the people change all the time. And they come together to do this dance to lift up um, and try to end sexual violence, uh, specifically for the One Billion Rising movement um, against uh, women and girls. Um, but I would argue, but let's just end it all. <laughs> let's just not have sexual violence. Um, and, and that's they they do this in a way that that brings it into the public, right? Drops something that that people don't talk about very often. Um, and and drops it in the literally in the public square, often in malls, in and and there's a performance, and there's part of the performance is building another world. And here I'm going to sound Gadamerian, and that's because I am a Gadamerian. Um, 
but building that other world that that shows what life could be like without sexual violence and it does it through art mm -hmm. so and it does it in a way that is life-giving disclosure it's not about re-traumatizing people but it's actually about saying uh, like one of the lines is you know this is my body my body's holy and people are embodying that notion that my body is holy in in a public space so that's what i would say Great. answers that question that is helpful shannon i implicated you in the question too right especially with respect to the phenomenological aspect you will not throw anything in yeah um i'm happy to speak about this um i think well i i think i have a two things to say with i think i don't think it's true that phenomenology is about subjectivity or individuality um so the issue here is is to unveil the structures of experience right so these are structures that of course are going to be basically we are experience you know i am an experiencer i am a perspective and that is the thing that phenomenology is interested in but it's interested in illuminating the structure of experience which means the truth that are operative inside of every experience, inside of every perspective as perspective. So it's a it's a universal um, discourse. Yeah. Uh, so so the structures of experience, for instance, are generally or most centrally, most powerfully, I think, in phenomenology, they're the the to to what we see when we look at the structures of experience is that we are interpersonally constituted. So the most basic truth about the structure of experience is that, well, uh, of course, it's always mine and it's always of something else. That's the basic thing that phenomenology starts with. But then the second thing is my perspective is constituted through my navigation of the perspectives of other people upon me. So therefore, I'm an interpersonal being and that and my sense of myself as an individual is always derivative. And that's this. The second step of phenomenology, and that's you know the, where Hegel's going with the struggle of the death and the, the ind in independence and dependence of self consciousness, and that's the the fundamental claim of phenomenology is that is to this the significance of the perspectives of others for the development of our own perspective, and from that um, you get you know you know the, the significance of care um, for that perspective coming from others, and you get the 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 um, necessity that forms of human life will always be cultured and specific um, in what Hegel calls ethical life, etc. Um, so that's one thing. But second, to, to talk about this issue, particularly of um, truth in, in Heidegger, to bring it back to that issue, I would I would say that with the issue of authenticity, we might think of that as like a an individualistic kind of we, we might think of that in, in an individualistic spirit, but authentic, authenticity is, is can you live up to the structures of experience, right? You're, can, are you honest about who you are and how you become yourself? Um, so, and, and one of the problems um, that I see with this, um, the, what uh, Lambert says about the, not that this is a problem with Lambert's account, but one of the issues there with the, the importance of, um, public authentication is that mostly we live inside an inauthentic culture where we're not honest about the conditions of our of the possibility of the development of our perspectives one of those is our interpersonal constitution the other is our being in the world where the world matters as much for our perspective as we do you know merle ponty says one is never sure whether it is the look or the things that command you know the world matter stuff objects are where who i am is constituted and if we are honest about those things if we are authentically answerable to them then we will care for our communities and we will care for nature right but because we are not honest because we are inauthentic because we travel in the they because we are you know immersed in idle talk um we don't own up to that as a culture and we are have become our own enemies you know and i'm thinking for instance of this issue of this this claim that i heard just recently that democracy is the enemy of of any meaningful opposition to climate change and that's where the rubber hits the road you know <laughs> like authenticity is not an individual matter it's a matter of owning up to the structures of experience which are interpersonal and interobjective um to, to make up a, a word where we are stuff among other stuff and 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 dependent upon the flourishing of stuff to be flourishing ourselves. So um, thank you for the opportunity to talk about that theme because I think it's really important here and
Thanks. Uh, anyone want to follow up? I, I particularly, I don't know for uh, uh, for Dean and Joe that idea of the uh, the possibility that we are collectively inauthentic, right? I mean, that resonates with that famous line from Adorno that I'm going to get wrong, right? It's you cannot live truly in a false society. I'm I'm sure I got that exactly wrong, right? Uh, but some idea that there's something. Um, wrong that's capturable in that kind of language of reality, authenticity, or truth um, with the world? Is that part of what, it, it, like I'm thinking particularly, Dean, about your, your questions about social action and mobilization and things like that. Is that a way of capturing some of the ways you're concerned about? I think so. I think <laughs> Shannon just said for now, analogy is not about subjectivity, but I guess I just want to say as a subject, yes, it works great for me. Um, <laughs> but like, but when I think about it, kind of in terms of social theory or, or sort of organizing or, or organizational theory, I think it's it's a challenge. Which is not to say it's useless, but it's just to say it's a challenge. Uh, insofar as like the the big the big question is, you know, how do we how do we affirm that reality that yes, we are stuff among other stuff. We have to kind of work it out with each other. And I I agree, like that is the key. Uh, but how do we do that in in a world that is full of ideology, right? For lack of a better term. And I think uh, for me, like I think Lambert does a really interesting job trying to give us some hand handholds, you know, or conceptual tools with that with societal principles. Um, but one thing that I thought came out in Jonathan's presentation of Lambert, so not to say about Lambert himself, but just the way that it's kind of expressed there, maybe Lambert can tell me whether or not this is exactly right, but I wonder, if to put it in kind of crass Marxist terms, like maybe it's too idealist, right? Like maybe if we just got these kind of ideas right, we kind of got our subjectivity right, the rest would sort of come along. And I guess for me, it's like, man, you know, like, the ideas are pretty bad these days. Like most most big ideas are not really getting us very far, and and we kind of already know everything there is to know. As far like the you know the the real challenge is how do we block out all that information we don't want and and really grasp that phenomenological reality that we are together and and uh, cracking that code. It's like I don't know. I always find myself caught between that Marxist insight that. It's a bit downstream from all these other material ways in which we're situated, or the structures of experience. Maybe to borrow something from from Shannon just now. So, yeah, or all even that. The getting people to care is not the biggest problem. It's being able to translate care into effective. That's right. Right. Yeah. That's right. Um, uh, in, um, but uh, and the there, you know, the disconnect there may or may not be something that's helpfully nameable in a phenomenological language. But you can also, right, it's also about social structures and the connection between public opinion and policy and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. There are other ways of holding that. Um, I want to call uh, uh, it uh, sort of, this is, this is first and foremost for, uh, um, uh, for Joe, uh, but then, you know, I got uh, things about with, with the, the stuff you raised about um, sort of these internal tensions within the reformational. Um, uh, tradition, as it were. Um, I think the big question is, uh, the fundamental question I want to ask is, what do you think, the, uh, or if you have any reflections on, what do you think the stakes are, and how far do you um, see it as a, as a robust disagreement um, between, say, Cal and Lambert, or is it just a question of degree? You, you mentioned um, you know, Lambert's not a pure historicist. He doesn't just think we're just historically making stuff up, right? We are responding to a, a meaningful call, trans-historical call to love. Um, and Cal, would, you know, believes that history happens too and it matters, right? And he's, you know, you have an, 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 uh, a process of disclosure and closing down and so on, right? You have an opening and closing process and things like that. Um, is it just a matter of more and less content in that trans-historical call? Cal wants lots of content. He wants it to be modally differentiated, and he wants sort of clear normative principles that have lots of definitional content, and Lambert just sort of wants to leave it. No, oh, right? Um, is, is, it, is it just that kind of stuff, or is there a robust disagreement? And if so, 
is this the like what are the stakes of that can we sort of just think we're a healthier tradition for having robust disagreement about this or is it the kind of thing that we actually need to settle this ah i think that it's healthy that there's a robust disagreement about this and the the disagreement shouldn't maybe be settled it, that again i really do think that the tension between the hard and the soft kind of religion is constitutive of the way god's call manifests in the world so the, so the fact that this tension exists is good the problem in my opinion is that uh Cerebell views the tension as 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 a sort of dichotomous opposition right. between like the truth and this sort of yeah cal sees the stakes as being pretty high this is, this is incorrect and i think i think that seeing this seeing the stakes in the way that cal sees it is perhaps maybe the way that it, sort of the way that that kind of religiosity goes wrong it gets it Ecclesiastes is, you know, at the end of Ecclesiastes, he says, you know, uh, what is the beginning of wisdom? Fear God, something like this. Like, there's still God in the abyss, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like for Cal, it, it almost like the abyss doesn't have God in it. If you go down that way, you'll eventually just sort of fall into, into sort of uh, nothingness. Yeah. Oh no, God is in the abyss. It, he's there. You just, if you go in correctly, you'll find him, and then that 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 will then make you better. Uh, being Cal, like the Cal, okay. that'll make Cal better. Yeah. Cal's position yeah. will be, he will be better in that sort of harder position if he's open to the, to the experience of sort of falling down into that sort of Lambertian style of religiosity. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> well, okay. If I could respond to something Dean was saying, uh, um, I, was, I was working on an essay on Greta Thunberg uh, uh, back, uh, back, when, back before Russia invaded Ukraine. I was trying to sort of work my way through the environmental catastrophe using Greta Thunberg as an interlocutor and then Russia invaded Ukraine, and I was just like, well, "What? What can I do?" I mean, but I mean, the move I was, I was sort of, I was sort of saying, Thunberg says, "Yo, we got to change the entire system." You know, you got these guys thinking we can reform it here and reform it there, but really, the entire global like economic system is wrong, and we have to fix it. And the move I was trying to make was to say, "Well, well Greta, like, great." That basically then we need Moses to show up and like just like how do we we need Moses like we need some gigantic sort of religious prophet to kind of take us in like Nelson Mandela like that kind of leadership seems to me to be the thing that, that I mean to say we're waiting for but I mean I, I don't I, and I don't I didn't know if I could make that that argument I, I felt like I can't, you can't really say we have to wait for Moses to show up to take us in the right direction that doesn't seem authentic but it, it really feels to me like that's the, the stakes of the of the, the sort of the, the threat that we're facing right now is 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 like the type of leader who can just take an entire culture and turn it in another direction that does happen i mean that has happened in the history of the human species things have been going one way and then they go another way but again like the moses has to be heard right like there's a there's a way that there's a there's a there's a relationship between the sort of prophet who speaks that word and the, and the people who hear it and I, I guess the the challenge i was trying to make to greta thunberg is you're like you're not deep enough yet like that's you're you're a, 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 le a couple of steps down the road towards that type of challenge but it's it's still not it's not strong enough yet i think that was so i thought in, in light of what you're saying that that was my response <laughs> like come on <laughs> so, yeah Anyway, thank you. Or maybe what we need is just lots of Moses, lots of Moses. basically yeah, doing yeah. jobs like Beans and Allison's yeah, and so yeah. on, and it's just sort of going around mobilizing people. And, Even um, right. uh, like in, you know, indigenous voices, right? I think the Iroquois yeah. Confederacy, there was a, there was a uh, Dekanawada, I can't remember the exact name or the pronunciation, but there, there was a like warfare, endless warfare in, in, the, in these things that were there before the Confederacy arose, and this guy showed up and he, somehow united the tribes into one giant confederacy of tribes and that, that seems to me to be the kind of thing and i think and no one trusts each other right like there's a great deal of display you know the russians invaded ukraine because they don't trust the americans for good reason the americans don't trust the russians for good reason the chinese don't trust us you know and then dekan awada i think he he threw himself off a waterfall to prove that he didn't actually have any ulterior motive you know he's just i just want there to be peace and he proved it by sort of risking his life, right? Like he, he put his life on the line in order to show that, that he's not just playing a power game. Because you can't play a power game if you're, if you're dead, right? Mm. So something, something like that is... is uh, Artful. Art, like, yeah, art, art. In many ways, it sounds like performance art. It's performance art. Right, and yet it's like deadly serious. Yeah, yeah. Yeah.
Um, one last question, and then we're going to give Lambert some time to respond. And then while Lambert's doing that, folks, we will still have some time after uh, after that for broader discussion. That's also for the people in the room, but also potentially online. Uh, if you're online, maybe the thing to do is um, formulate uh, is to put in the chat that you have a question, and uh, we've got people who can monitor that, monitor that, and flag it. And so we'll communicate with that. Um, but one last question. Uh, this, is, this came to me principally by uh, listening to, to Dean's presentation, so I'll throw it to you first. Um, is the, the, the tension that you sort of have reading these two different essays indicative of maybe that there's a bit of a tension sort of in reformational social thought between, on the one hand, this sort of ideal of architectonic critique, right? We get really get under the structures, right? We don't leave it at surface level changes. We really try to get under the structures and in Lambert's term, try to find the how, the way, how our society are just riddled with, so with societal evil and really get under there. And then on the other hand, a sort of social ontology um, that, you know, sphere sovereignty different, right? That basically affirms more or less of the structures of liberal democratic modernity, right? Um, not, not absolutely, plenty of social critique in there, but it's sort of basically, yeah, no differentiation is more or less a good thing, um, the differentiate, right? Um, uh, and so that, is there a tension in terms of like how meaningfully radical it can be that sometimes if you run down the architectonic critique route, you can get pretty radical, but then if you get too far, you stop being reformational, so then you end up tacking back to just sort of good, um, reflective, but you're basically doing policy thinking that takes for granted more or less the structures of the world around you, right? Um, you know, liberal democratic capitalism in some way. Is that a tension that's there? And is that part of what maybe lies behind that ambivalence you have even with Lambert's own work? Yeah, I think that is a tension. And I'll try to maybe answer this in a way too that can uh, open up a question about reformational philosophy that we can jump into. I, I think it's a tension in the tradition and it's one that ICS inherits in many different ways. So Lambert is one voice, but I think you see the same thing in Ron, Jim, Hank, Nick, all the rest of them. I think everybody is dealing with that kind of tension um, because, uh, you know, the irony is like the Kuyperian tradition is the, the anti-revolutionary modernity party, really. Yeah. Right? Like it is a, I mean, for all the important critique of modernism that has come out of ICS in particular, um, there is this, as you say, this kind of fundamental, uh, I don't know, relationship, I guess, to that. And I think ICS is the, the voice of that tradition that has struggled the most with how far can you get on the margins and even maybe outside of that, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's to ICS's credit and Lambert is a fantastic exemplar of that in particular. I think where it kind of creates some challenge in Lambert's work for me is uh, it's precisely on that sort of, that, that question of like, Lambert is willing to name capitalism as a problem in a way that I think is deeper than any other reformational thinker, deeper than Godfard, for instance. It's a kind of critique of capitalism that, as I said earlier, learns from Marxism in a really deep kind of way. But that question is, you know, but, but what's after that? There's not a reformational socialist tradition, right? Like, mm -hmm. there's maybe reformational people who would say they're socialist and so on, but there is not a, like, a book out there that says, and here's the Kuyperian way of whatever, being a socialist and doing the rechanging the mode of production this way. So I think all that to say what I've loved most about Lambert and learning over the years on politics and, and everything else. I even took a truth class. I had no interest in truth, but I was like, I've got to learn it from Lambert if I'm going to learn it from anybody. I think that comes down to Lambert's willingness to, to engage the themes that come up in the reformational tradition in a way that is like profoundly open to so many other voices, including the arts, including uh, phenomenology, you know, and and that's I think to Lambert's real credit to have uh, to given have given that to the tradition as a way of both challenging it, as you kind of point out in your essay, but also deepening it and, and pushing it forward. Thanks. Anyone else want to jump in on that? Otherwise, we can let Lambert. We can use that as a. a for, uh, to let Lambert do, uh, uh, come on up. And he can set us all right and on a better and more well, so reliable path. So the best time for teachers is when your students teach you. 
So I found that really, really moving. And I, I will address the issues, but I do want to say that I um, personally feel very honored by your taking these issues and the tradition that this institute comes from and engaging with it seriously, you know, engaging with the issues seriously, engaging with the tradition seriously, engaging with my work seriously. <clears throat> so that's the first thing. Now to the issues. <laughs> So thank you. Now here's where you all got it wrong. No, you didn't get anything wrong. I mean, you raised different points of questioning and concern and unclarity. And, you know, I'm still writing. I'm still figuring things out. One of the things I said years ago that I wanted to do, if I had the stamina and the passion and the good health to do it, is to write Yep, one more big volume, and that's going to be on um, globalization, especially economic globalization, uh, civil society, and global ethics. So one of the things that I keep hearing from you and from, from others is, where in the world could there be an impetus for significant change that would affect the entire direction of society? And now we're not talking about one society, we're talking about the world society, because we're all implicated in the ecological disaster. And we're all implicated in the fundamental injustices that people suffer day to day. So where could that change, where could that impetus come from? Do we need another Moses, or do we need multiple Moseses? Well, one of my thoughts has been that, unlike other people who are in the critical theory tradition or draw heavily on it, I still think that the world's religions, in which I would include indigenous religions, as well as the more systematically organized religions, including Christianity, Judaism, Confucianism, etc that they have the potential to point us in a more life-giving direction. But they can't do that as individual traditions. They actually have to do that in conversation and dialogue about what are the most fundamental sort of values. I call them societal principles and how do we understand them coming from our rich traditions, and how can we together share that wisdom in a way that actually would point society and the structures of society and the leaders in those structures in a different direction, in a direction that actually makes for justice and makes for solidarity among peoples and makes for the healing of the earth. That's not gonna get us to revolution anytime soon, <laughs> I'm sorry because it's something that requires a long, long time. Um, and that's part of my saying, revolution isn't what it used to be. I mean, these issues are so complicated and so interwoven with the various fabrics of our lives that it's very hard to imagine a change happening that would actually be the right change, as it were. I'm not, you know, I don't try to nail down right and wrong that clearly, but a change in the direction of life giving disclosure or what I talk about is interconnected flourishing, interconnected flourishing that involves not just human beings, but all Earth and all creatures. So that's, that's the one thing that I, I would say, you know, I, I think there's more to be done working with the world's religions uh, that they shouldn't be discounted. Now, I just finished of about a month ago, reading Habermas's latest huge tome. It's a two-volume work in German, 1,700 pages. 
He finished it in his 89th year. It's called Auch eine Geschichte der Philosophie. And the theme is really the relationship between faith and knowledge, which he traces from the, what he calls the axial religions right through the 19th century. And he's, his whole point in doing that is to still ask, is there something that could, religions can offer that philosophy and you know the sciences more generally need to pay attention to? And he wants to say yes, but he can't give up much content. And I think the only way to give content to that is actually to listen to the religions and what they have to offer and have them communicating with each other. So that's the, the idea that I have. Dean had said in an interview we did that he'd like me to pursue that project. I haven't committed to it right now. I'm taking a break from writing books for a few months at least. Um, on the topic of truth, <clears throat> there are two things. You know, when I talk about truth, I talk about disclosure, but I also talk about fidelity. And those two things for me need to be in correlation with each other, that you don't have truth if you have just one or the other. You actually have both. And um, the crit criticisms or the questions arise from either of those sides. So Cal's worries have to do with my notion of societal principles, which I think are formed by human beings over the ages and, and change as we come to more understanding of what justice requires. As society changes, justice does require other things than what it required earlier and so on. So it's an emerging guideline, if you will. And Cal hears that as maybe giving up on the notion of creational ordinances, which God has given to us from the very beginning. You know, this is what justice is. This is what justice required. So that's, that's where one of the issues is. But Somebody asked whether there's a deeper issue. I think there is. I think it has to do with the way we imagine the relationship between God and humanity. Um, if we imagine that God is, as it were, the commander, the one who says, that's the way you have to do it, folks, otherwise you're going to have serious problems, then uh, that means humanity isn't much of a partner. Humanity is always in the position of obeying trying to get it right, but God is sovereign and in control. Uh, it's traditional Calvinism, right? No, traditional Christianity. But Calvinism has a very strong emphasis on divine sovereignty. And I think the complement to that often is a very low view of humanity, informed by notions of original sin, uh, human depravity, the finitude of us uh, as human beings. And so, in a way, human beings can't be partners with God because it's God's in control and we're, who are we? We're just human beings. I think my background image, which I've never spelled out in print, is really one of partnership. And then when, when God calls us to love, God is calling us to love in a way that says, okay, now it's up to you, you respond, you respond. And when you respond, I'll respond. And when I respond, you'll respond. And it goes back and forth. And so the development of societal principles for me is really human beings responding to a call that doesn't have a lot of content because I don't think there's a God-given command to be just. I think God calls us to love. And one of the things God calls us to, given the kind of society we inhabit, is in that society, to do that which contributes to human flourishing. And what contributes to human flourishing? Well, being just with one another and being just in our governance structures and the like. Exercising solidarity and the like. We discover that, we find that. We also deny it a lot and we reject it and so on. We fight about it, but still, that's, that's for me. That's the process of, if you will, revelation of disclosure of what God wants. It's through human beings. And I think that's a, probably a fundamental theological difference. Um, but we've never had a debate about that, uh, Cal and I, as far as I can remember. And it doesn't really come out in his essay, but I think maybe that's the background issue that needs to be talked about, not just between Cal and me, but between you know, the various participants in the Reformational tradition where this 
think has, has always been a background issue. Um, that's on the fidelity to societal principles side. The disclosure side, I, I certainly have learned a great deal from Heidegger. And I, I admire, you know, especially the design insight, the being in time breakthrough for getting us to think much more broadly and um, creatively about what truth comes to and how within that context we can think about what most philosophers name as truth, which has much more to do with propositions and assertions and claims and the like. Uh, and so I think he, he just opened a, a real, real potential for rethinking even that kind of truth, what I call assertoric truth, the truth of assertions, claims, propositions, and the like. So that for me has been very, very important. And he does that in, con in, in the context of thinking about disclosedness and disclosure. I think that's a, a huge shift in a, in a better direction. But I also, of course, as uh, Shannon knows too, I have my problems with Heidegger because in the end, the way he secures that, uh, that, that notion of truth is by insisting on a kind of authenticity, which in Heidegger means facing up to the possibility of your own death. I don't think that's a bad thing to do. I just don't think that's the guarantee for truth. So the thing that's gonna really make us, you know, mm -hmm embrace disclosure. So that's that's where I have my differences with Heidegger to begin with, and then later Heidegger or other issues. So um, this notion that there that we are creatures among creatures and that part of our role in this creatureliness is to allow other creatures to disclose themselves in their in their uniqueness, in their relationships, in their glory, I think you can get that out of Heidegger. I think that's really, really, really important. And I think that's got to be, remain a, a, no, a part of one's notion of truth. But I think that always has to be paired up with this sort of this call to love that I talked about as being manifest in the societal principles that human beings themselves are working out and continue to respond to. Um, Maybe the last thing I should talk about, I know I've gone on a while, is this uh, tension that was talked about between the, the Marxist side of art and the Gaussian side of art or whatever it is. Uh, yeah, I take Marx really seriously. I taught a course uh, at Calvin College for years called Marx and Marxism. And we spent half the semester on Marx and had the other half of the semester on Marxism. And we read Lenin and we read uh, Rosa Luxemburg, we read parts of the Dialectic of Enlightenment. Uh, never got around to Habermas. We have to do that with undergraduates. <laughs> uh, I think Marx put his finger, his whole hand, on the internal dynamic of capitalism that makes it so destructive. Now, I know you can also say about capitalism that it's very creative, it's very productive, it's very, you know, it does amazing things with the resources that are available. I mean, there are many good things to say about it. But finally, you have to ask, and who's profiting from it, and at what expense? And Marx is able to get at that level of dynamic. And that's really, really crucial. If you don't acknowledge that, I think you end up with a sort of, I don't know, I, I think of it as wishy-washy reformism. Or you think, well, we'll just tinker around the edges a little bit. You know, maybe there could be a sustainable capitalism. We can just ignore the fact that capitalism, according to Jason Moore, um, uh, is required to exploit the cheaps, the cheaps of nature, the cheaps of unpaid labor in the household, for example, the women's work that some people talk about. And now it, it's required to exploit your personal data. You're not getting paid for that. And it's barely regulated by the government. Capitalism requires that. So it's not only that it requires that some people you know, on the older Marxist model 
work for very little and generate a huge profit for somebody else. But also that nature itself, the air, the earth, the water, all of that can be exploited and without compensation really. I mean, obviously gradually government regulations start modifying that. So I think that's really important. And I think um, reformational philosophy, because it is concerned about issues of social justice and stewardship, and uh, in its own way showing solidarity among peoples, owes itself to maybe revisit the Marxist tradition and try to see whether there's something that needs to be learned from that. I, I, I think Marx and people after Marx got a lot right. Uh, that does not make me uh, an orthodox Marxist any more than I'm an orthodox reformational thinker. I think of myself as a, a, a creative reformational thinker who's learned a lot from other traditions at the same time. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. I also just wanted to say thank you to, you know, a bunch of people, and I will do that now, and then I'll leave you to whatever conversation you still want to have. So first of all, thank you, Peter. <laughs> Peter, um, Peter and I, you know, most people don't realize that philosophers have another life, as it were, that they have friendships, they have people who might not be themselves professional philosophers who actually dialogue with you and take your ideas seriously and run with them. Peter's like that. So he's been, um, yeah, he's been one of those people who makes me think, well, I guess that's worth it. So thank you, Peter. <clears throat> and thank you to the other editors of the book, Hector, who's sitting here to my left. Michael and Matt, you put together, I think, a very, very beautiful and uh, significant volume. So I'm very honored by that. Um, if I may, I would also like to thank the many contributors in the volume. I'm not going to name them all. There are a lot of them. Uh, as fashion of school, this is one of the most um, content-rich and person-rich volumes that you can imagine, because there are so many essayists and artists and poets who have contributed, and um, beautiful work. Thank you to all of them. And some of them are online now, but others, of course, can join us. But thank you. I, I also want to thank the mentors and instructors who pointed me to the scholarly path I've been following and help me learn to walk it. Um, some of them are no longer with us. Uh, I do think that Professors John Van Dyke and John Bannerstelt at what is now Dort University, it had fewer pre pretensions when I was there, is Dort College, and before that is Dort Junior College. Um, in any case, they are the ones who introduced me to reformational philosophy and gave me the sense that this is something I could spend my life working at. And they're the ones who sent me to the Institute to study in 1972. Then uh, my mentors and instructors at uh, ICS, Cal Sierveld, who couldn't be here, but I will be visiting him tomorrow. Uh, Hank Hart. Um, my next book, The Big Book on Truth, is dedicated to Hank. And fortunately, I had written the preface before he died so he could read it, so he could uh, read the dedication. Jim Altheus, I still owe you a completed paper. <laughs> <laughs> and Deutero Isaiah, I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> I mean, I got far, but I didn't really finish it to my own satisfaction. Uh, Arnold de Graff, whom I got to know actually much later. I didn't know him very well when he was an instructor at ICS, but later he read my book, The Artistic Truth, and he is now also an artist. And um, we struck up a conversation. 
and uh, we've continued that. Thomas McIntyre, who's here, has some good discussions with Matt, uh, Thomas. I won't tell you where all of them happened. Al Walters and Bernard Zylstra. Those were all people whose classes I attended or who in conversation I learned from. Bernie in particular, I learned a great deal because we'd go over to their house and Joyce and Josina would play recorders and piano together and Bernie and I would talk political philosophy. And then finally, uh, Johan van der Hooven, uh, at the Free University of Amsterdam. Who, who knew the Marxist tradition, the phenomenological tradition, had read Adorno, could really, really help me firm up the dissertation, which I had pretty well written in Berlin, but it needed quite a bit of tweaking, shall we say. Then uh, my former colleagues, I've taught at uh, schools in the Reformed tradition my entire career. So I uh, started out at King's and Calvin University now and then ICS, also my colleagues at uh, Toronto School of Theology and the University of Toronto. It's been a real privilege to interact with so many fine scholars in different schools, and uh, I, I really treasure those collegial relations. Also, the many former students I have from these various schools, but especially the graduate students I was able to work with in my last 14 years, uh, both at ICS and at the University of Toronto, and some of the contributors to this volume were actually students at the University of Toronto. They, didn't, they took some seminars at ICS, but they were U of T students. Uh, I've always admired the supporters of ICS and the staff of ICS who make this whole venture of faith work. Um, it's a very unusual project to have a donor-funded graduate school. That uh, it's impossible in most worlds, but that it's possible in the world we're in right now. So that's great. I really appreciate that. I've, I've said to many people, ICS, the Institute for Christian Studies, has been my entire academic life, has been my uh, intellectual and spiritual home, and it still is. Then uh, just a few more. I wanted to say thank you to everybody who's present here in the room. Uh, also, anybody who's online, thank you. Uh, many of you, uh, I would really love to see again in person, but of course, that's not possible. Uh, I also want to thank my wife, Joyce Recker. She and I um, moved to Berlin in the first year of our marriage. And we like to say we had an extended honeymoon because when we arrived there, we knew nobody. We knew absolutely nobody, and we had to find our own way. Uh, and those are glorious years, and that's <clears throat> is in that context. Actually, Joyce ended up typing the manuscript that was my dissertation. The published version of the manuscript is a typescript by Joyce. Um, I, it was during that time that we learned what Adorno meant in a sort of a side comment in Minimum Moralia when he was describing the difficulties people had in marriage, but also in a side comment, he actually described marriage in the following way. It is das un, unwachsame Vertrauen des gemeinsamen Lebens. A loose translation, because you can't really get it in English the way it comes across in German, is the intimate trust of life together. So, we've been doing that for 45 years, 46 in January. Also, I want to acknowledge Joyce's parents and family and my parents, now deceased, and my family. Um, it's important to have support from the people who know you the best and have cared for you from the very, very beginning. I'll tell you just one anecdote here. Um, my mom, uh, well, my, my dad too, they were both Dutch immigrants. My mom was six when her family of eight children and two parents immigrated from Groningen to California. And my mom started school in Ripon, California. So she came, Dutch kid, first year of school was in English. And she was held back a year 
So she had to repeat that first year. Um, and I think that, as well as having six brothers who ruled the roost, made her uh, yeah, think of herself as not as gifted, perhaps, maybe not as intellectually astute, but, and that might have also contributed to the fact that she dropped out of school uh, after one year in high school. But she was a real um, dialogue partner. She and I could argue philosophy, not even knowing it was philosophy, by arguing theology, because that's what we knew. And not just arguing, but exploring it. And she's very, very gifted that way. Um, so <clears throat> when I finished my first academic book, which came out of my dissertation, it's called Adorno's Aesthetic Theory. There's a copy out on the table. You can check it out. Uh, I gave a copy to my parents. And um, I mentioned them in the preface. Uh, my mom took that book and put it on the coffee table in the living room. Uh, this is in sunny California. The sun beat in the window of that living room every afternoon. And you could tell the book had been there for a long, long time by the time that uh, she had to move into a nursing home because the cover was completely faded. It didn't look at all like the covers that I have in my own library collection. Uh, and then she told me, you know, Lambert, uh, I tried to read your book. Any of you have read Adorno, I know that's a challenge for anybody, no matter what your level of education is. I tried to read your book, and I got through about 50 pages. I thought, wow. <laughs> Most people would stop after page two. Uh, and then she said in Dutch, dat gaat mijn pet te boven. <laughs> Goes right over my head. <laughs> But the thing is that she showed that kind of uh, interest and support. Uh, let me conclude, and I don't know how long I've gone on. I hope you don't mind if I go just a minute or so longer with a poem that appeared in the bulletin this past Sunday at Westminster Presbyterian Church, where I'm a member and I'm, uh, I sing in the choir. And the theme of the church service was gratitude. And the poem that was in the bulletin is by Mary Oliver. And it's a poem that comes from a longer poem. Uh, On thy wondrous works I will meditate. It's a sort of a, uh, a revisiting of Psalm 145. This is how this part of the poem goes. Every morning, I want to kneel down on the golden cloth, the golden cloth of the sand and say some kind of musical thanks for the world that is happening again. Another day, from the shawl of wind coming out of the west to the firm green flesh of the melon lately sliced open and eaten, its chill and ample body flavored with mercy. I want to be worthy of what? Glory. Yes, unimaginable glory. O oh, Lord of melons, of mercy. Though I am not ready nor worthy, I am climbing toward you, climbing toward you. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think that may be a good place to wrap up our discussion. It's at least those in the room can continue it afterwards. But I want to turn things back to Peter to send us off. Uh, when I finished my master's thesis in 1979, it was clear to me that I didn't have a career in philosophy. But many things that I think we're already simmering in people like Lambert and myself and Rebecca 
then I see is really blossoming now. So I think that's great. Thank you, Lambert, for your friendship and Joyce. Um, I think next is we're going to go to the Christie Mansion. It's out here. It's out here. It's out here. I'm sure there are plenty of people that know the way and we can follow them. Also, at the reception, you'll find table where you can leaf through and buy the Fest script, view copies of Lambert's published book, and pick up information on how to order at a discount shattering silo. So uh, I invite you to do that. So thanks, everyone. Um, I loved it. Take care.